Hello, my name is Jessica Bissett, and I'm the Director of Leadership Programs at the National Committee on U.S.-China Relations. The subject of today's interview is China's demographic crisis, with a particular focus on the views of Chinese women towards having more children. Joining me today to explore this layered and nuanced topic are two experts. First, we have Carl Minzner, Senior Fellow for China Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations and a professor at Fordham Law School, specializing in Chinese politics and law. Carl is also a member of the National Committee's Public Intellectuals Program. He is joined by Dr. Ye Liu, Senior Lecturer in the Department of International Development at King's College, London. Her research focuses on the long-term impacts of China's one-child policy on women's life chances, family formation, and intergenerational relationships. Carl and Dr. Leo, thank you so much for speaking with me today. You're welcome. My Thanks pleasure. Thanks so for having us. Great. So let's jump right into it. Carl, I'm going to start with you. Can you give us an overview of what demographic challenges China is currently facing? What are some of the historical trends we've been observing? What are some of the reasons behind China's declining birth rate? Sure. Thank you so much. It's my pleasure to be here and honored to be with Dr. Leo as well discussing this important subject. Birth rates in China have been declining since the 1970s. And of course, part of the reason are state policies, such as the 1970s era Wan Xishao campaign, which encouraged couples to marry later and to have fewer children, um, as well as the more well-known 1980s era one child policy, which impo imposed mandatory limits. But other reasons for the decline in birth rate include factors that are common throughout the world. High housing costs are leading young people to delay marriage, High educational costs and the need to take care of aging parents are leading millennial or younger to have fewer children. And of course, a combination of all of those factors is leading to a decrease in birth rates worldwide. But East Asia, including China, now has among the lowest fertility rates worldwide. In Taiwan and South Korea, it's actually hovering right around slightly over one, sometimes under one child uh, per, per, per woman over the course of her life. Uh, and it's important to flag that there are with respect to the why East Asia has among the lowest birth rates in all of the world, it's important to flag there are at least two important factors. And the first is entrenched patriarchal norms that make many young women find marriage an unattractive option, particularly if it means they will be stuck caring for the in-laws and children with uh, no help uh, from anyone else. Uh, and the second is strong social taboos against out of wedlock births. The combination of those two are important. In comparison, for example, with Northern Europe, where 50, sometimes 70% of uh, births are to unmarried individuals, that's very uncommon in East Asia. And consequently, if people don't marry, particularly in China and elsewhere, it's unlikely that they will actually have children. And so that's one other really important factor to focus on the reason for the decline in birth rates. I'm gonna say one other thing, which is note that there's nothing inherently problematic or wrong with a country having a declining birth rate and an aging population, as long as societies are willing and prepared to take the necessary steps to adjust. But doing so generally does involve fairly significant society-wide alterations. Examples include slashing pension pro promises, extending the age that people are expected to work. Japan is now raising, moving its retirement age up to 70. Closing down colleges that were built in a period when there were more young people. Taiwan is on track to close or merge at least a, a third of its universities within the near future. And generally figuring out how to rework your urban planning, medical systems, and labor markets for a much older population. And precisely because many of those policies are so disruptive and political challenging, you generally find political leaders, not only in China, but elsewhere, finding that the demographic, this is a demographic crisis, which is going to prompt them to have to try to figure out how some way to respond. Well, you've given us a lot to chew on, but first I'm gonna circle back over to Dr. Liu and I wanna get your opinion. So what does the China's demographic crisis tell us about the status of women in particular in China and their predicaments in Chinese society today? Um, the demographic uh, crisis uh, Carl just mentioned offers a very rare opportunity for us to assess women's status in China. When we talk about demographic crisis, women always become scapegoats for such crises. 
But in China, let's look at reassess women's status to look at discrepancies between women's contribution to the society, to the economy, and women's representation in political leadership, in the legal framework. Um, so first of all, women is a central to China's economy. A women's labor force participation has been consistently high, higher than um, their counterparts in, in the US and OECD countries from 1990s until uh, re, uh, last uh, to, uh, 2010. And uh, women also uh, hold a large proportion of white color, what we call the white color occupations in the last decades. Women are also big spenders. They have driven a variety of consumer uh, markets. And we can see women are also innovators. Recently, we have witnessed this kind of revival of stand up comedians uh, in China and, you know, female. Uh, leading films like Hi Mom or Sisters kind of smashed uh, uh, the box uh, of uh, the, the box office. So, um, however, women are not represented in the party leadership. When we look at um, Chinese Communist Party's uh, leadership gender ratio representation, uh, female leaders only accounted for around 11%. When we look at younger cohort, um, female leaders only counted for around 8%. Now let's look at another discrepancy uh, about uh, legislations which address specifically um, about female equal rights, uh, about women equal rights, about inheritance, about women's um, general well being, about uh, maternity care, uh, you know, to date around uh, around 10 legislation specifically uh, dedicated to this kind of what we call women centered policies um, in comparison to the total around 260 legislations since the foundation of the People's Republic of China. Um, in short, the, the problem for China's Democrat a demographic crisis is for a very long time, men have been making policies for women. You can definitely hear that. Um, so taking what you just said and kind of what Carl introduced at the beginning, what has been the response of Chinese women to the recent policy shifts from the two child to the three child policy? We know, you know, through your work, you've interviewed Chinese women from across the socioeconomic spectrum. We know that China isn't a monolith and that opinions may vary. So there might be some people who don't mind the policies or appreciate the policies and others may not. So could you unpack your research a little bit for us? What did it reveal? Was there a, a wide range of responses? And I know there, is a, there are some generational differences. So I, I would love for you to get into that a little bit more. Thank you, it's an excellent question. Um, so generally speaking, um, the three child policy almost kind of triggered a comical effect in the general public. And if you have been following social media, you can see the Chinese citizens had a lot of uh, kind of a, uh, you know, very interesting um, expression um, on social media. And, uh, you know, broadly speaking, most of my, I have been, uh, Tracy have been following stories of China's Baling Ho, 82 women born after 1980, the first generation of a one-child policy, and ask them about their perceptions of a two-child policy and a three-child policy. And most of my respondents um, were not very uh, enthusiastic about this kind of uh, top-down notice asking for a baby. Um, however, I, I, uh, I, I do not want to kind of have a sweeping uh, summary of, uh, you know, as the only response from Chinese women, uh, the, the, the decision about fraternity and the fraternity choices 
um, largely dependent on women's, or what I call the position or advantage and disadvantages in relation to their husbands. So it's a joint decision about having babies within individual families. It's very likely to be the case whereby um, the husbands or husband's family want want more children because of the traditional patriarchal culture and there's a long lost kind of nostalgia for more, for, for a larger family, particularly from the husband's family. When a women, what we call a positional advantage, for instance, their socioeconomic status, higher than their, par uh, than their husbands, or their parents could provide more financial or support or social capital for the individual family, they are more likely to have an uphand in terms of negotiate, negotiating fertility decisions with their husbands. But when the women, particularly their socioeconomic state, status or their income lower than their husband or they rely in particular, in a lot of cases, women rely on their in-laws, their husbands for property ownership or property purchase they have limited a say in fertility decisions. Mm. Um, I've been following the stories of China's Baling Ho, but I also want to kind of emphasize, uh, you know, children of a one-child policy are, are not the same. So they can be divided as Baling Ho, Jiu Ling Ho, Ling Ling Ho. They all have a kind of a generational differences, different kind of coho experiences. Um, apart from Ba Ling Ho, Jiu Ling Ho, Li Ling Ho, those children, those siblings, daughters and sons born into one child policy, they have different um, experiences, life course experiences during their transition to university education, to the labor market. And younger generations, particularly Jiu Ling Ho, Li Ling Ho, they face a wide range of challenges different types of challenges than those from Ba Ling Ho. For instance, Jiu Ling Ho particularly worried about having children, starting family because of uh, degree inflation. So they are less likely to hold professional jobs than Ba Ling Ho. And they're also struggling to climb on property ladder. Um, they're also facing this kind of a, you know, ongoing crisis in terms of uh, uh, employment opportunities, particularly jobs matching their educational uh, back, uh, qualifications. So this wide range of effects put younger generation off from starting family and from having children. Mm. So a different generation have their different concerns. For the Baling Ho, the women I've been for, uh, uh, following in the last uh, uh, five years, they shared a lot of concerns about uh, workplace um, discriminations and misogynistic practices, lack of uh, affordable childcare, and uh, generally they're forgotten by top leadership. They are not valued by top leadership in the policy making. That makes sense. And I think some of the next questions we're going to cover are going to dive a little bit deeper into the leadership and some of the decisions they've made and maybe some of the, the decisions that you, you think they should be making. Um, Carl, let's turn it back to you. What policies have the Chinese government implemented to combat the demographic crisis? You mentioned before potentials to change the healthcare system, to lower the age of retirement, other things. Have, has the Chinese government made any signals that they so, so um, the might be starting to do that? And do you expect these policies to be effective? So of course, the, the big thing you have to mention is that, you know, as Dr. Leo pointed out, one of the big policy shifts that's taken place in recent years has been actually lifting the mandatory limits that previously existed on the number of children. So right. China moved from a one-child policy to a two-child policy in 2016, and then moved to a three-child policy this year. And of course, as Dr. Leo mentioned, it, the impact has been limited precisely because it doesn't address the root causes uh, that are, in fact, I think, driving the social decision on the part of 
Chinese citizens not to have uh, children. Uh, what's now happening is twofold. So if I'm if you're categorizing sort of the big steps that I see Beijing taking now is first Beijing just recently has begun to announce sweeping proposals to try to reduce the burdens that families face in terms of raising and educating children. Um, we're still waiting for the details on many of those to come out, but you're seeing some of this big campaign that's taking place to sort of uh, crack down on um, uh, you know, uh, for-profit education, on homework, on the associated burdens as, you know, associated with cram schools and getting your children through. That's, that has been a major push that Chinese authorities have taken just within the last month or two. Um, and I suspect f further details will come out with respect to shifts to fact taxation, finance, housing, and employment to try to make child caring, uh, child, child rearing more attractive or less burdensome for parents. But there's a second thing that's important to mention too as well, and that I'm seeing Beijing steadily pivot back towards a more traditionalist narrative, uh, mm -hmm. emphasizing marriage and family values. This is of course bigger than just demographics or fertility. It fuses with um, sort of the propaganda that the, the Xi, that's under Xi Jinping has begun to come out in, in China associated with, I phrase it as kind of jettisoning, slowly jettisoning some of the Maoist heritage at least with respect to sort of you know socialist feminism and sort of gradually beginning to import more traditionalist narratives about the role of a family of women in taking care of children. Um, and I think that's building. I could easily, I'm not sure where this is gonna go, but I see this beginning to, and, and it fuses exactly with the Dr. Leo mentioned about somebody within the apparatus starting to see the problem as young people not doing their patriotic duty to marry, and women not doing the responsible thing in terms of having children. And I think that's a narrative starting to build within, as Dr. Leo mentioned, a largely male uh, state apparatus, party state apparatus. Now, with respect to whether those policies will be successful, the first, you know, beginning to try to undertake financial changes and, and encourage children, that might make some difference. Although Taiwan and South Korea, frankly, have tried many of those as well with very limited success. The second strikes me as, shifting in the direction of sort of a, of a more traditional narrative, that strikes me as going exactly the opposite and the wrong direction because that's actually the major problem that Taiwan, South Korea, and Japan are experiencing. That entrenched attitudes are precisely what make women not want to have children. Um, so I'll stop there. No, I think it's all the things that you mentioned kind of part of this new common prosperity rhetoric and regime with the different crackdowns, I mean, Clearly, the CCP sees these problems as a potential threat to their to its legitimacy, um, and I think it's interesting that you know they're worried that the younger generations are not going to want to fulfill their patriotic duty. But I guess to Dr. Leo, I going back to you and kind of your research. I mean, I think it goes the other way too. It seems like the younger generations. Um, already aren't necessarily, they're already starting to question the party's legitimacy and that the party doesn't have their interests necessarily um, at the top of the, of the docket in terms of what they need to address in order for them to play a role in society and potentially have children. I mean, do you think the party thinks that, that young women in China can have it all? And are they willing to kind of put those policies in place that would maybe increase their, its legitimacy in the eyes of the younger generations? Uh, I think it's a make or break point for the Chinese Communist Party to take that decision to become a more uh, gender, inclusive, gender inclusive, more egalitarian kind of policy uh, making in, in, in the future. So when we look at this, uh, uh, you know, Party's relationship with the younger generation is very interesting. We need to look at uh, from a life course perspective. So probably we all know the Chinese Communist Party very um, uh, had a strong emphasis on patriotic education. So when the young people young people in schools in universities, they have been following patriotic education. You know, it used to be when I was in university with Deng Xiaoping thoughts and uh, Marxist, of course, Marxist Deng Xiaoping thoughts and now Xi Jinping thoughts. It has been embedded throughout the education system. You know, you, on the one hand, you see Chinese young 
people very patriotic and sometimes even, you know, had kind of embracing national nationalism attitudes. But on the other hand, when they had this kind of life called transition, when they move into the labor market, when they experienced, you know, recent crackdown on the tutoring sector, probably tutoring sector, and we call it the, you know, the slowing cooking crisis about youth unemployment will have a knock-on impact on young people's attitudes, particularly about their own concerns, a wide range of concerns, jobs, security, property ownership, like a balling hole, like uh, their older, you know, kind of uh, brothers and, you know, it's kind of, imagine it's not real brothers and sisters, the previous generation. So they, they made that comparison. They constantly have this kind of a gener generational autobiography in terms of their, you know, advantages, disadvantages of a different cohorts among the one child generation. So I think uh, it, it's a very, you know, important moment for the Chinese Communist Party to rethink about how to build a society more inclusive and also addressing young people's um, concerns and also to ensure the upward social mobility opportunities available for wider sector of the society, particularly younger generations. Great. I kind of want to shift gears a little bit. Carl, you've mentioned South Korea and Taiwan a couple of times. Can you unpack a little bit more for us um, how China's demographic challenges compare to what South Korea and Taiwan face or have faced in the past? What have South Korea and Taiwan tried to do to address these challenges? Were they successful? You mentioned a lot of the things they did were not. Um, I just think it's helpful to take a step back and get a little bit more of a um, a wider sense of, of comparison when we look at China compared to what's going on in other East Asian countries. Sure, I mean, you think that one thing that to, it's important to recognize is that the stuff that's, the things that are happening in China are not totally unique to China. They have similarities with things that are happening worldwide, but they specifically have strong similarities to things that were occurring, that have already occurred and are occurring in Taiwan, South Korea, and Japan. Um, in all of those societies, you know, birth rates have declined to among the lowest in the world. Um, and those societies are both grappling with how do you uh, address the practical consequences of a rapidly aging society. They're also grappling with the question of what would you might you do in order to try to encourage people to have uh, more children if that's something that leaders deem. And I can try to talk about both of those. So first, the policies that all of those societies have adopted, they range from trying to encourage more births through direct financial incentives, baby bonuses, which have very limited impact, expanding state-provided childcare institutions to attempting to gradually rework gender norms to encourage fathers to take paternity leave, to support unmarried uh, couples and single mothers who decide to have children. And of course, the problem with respect to that is that many of those policies are very controversial, both in countries such as the United States, but also in East Asia. Um, and so uh, that is something that I think you know Chinese leaders themselves should think about, and particularly you know in terms of suggestions on that front for party leaders. I think it's really interesting to realize that if you look at a country like Japan, which is really trying to figure out how do you actually make it more attractive for people to have children, one of the key things they're trying to do is to try to encourage men to take time off and help take care of children. Mm -hmm. You almost think that boy, if you had an example of a country that could successfully launch a campaign throughout an entire country promoting gender equality, that might be something to consider. China, that's something that China actually had experience with in the 1950s. What about a campaign that was encouraging, you know, male party cadres to take, take, you know, do half the child, half the work with respect to, you know, child rearing and housework. I mean, that would be an interesting campaign that somebody could consider. The problem, of course, it runs smack the, in the opposite direction as to the, uh, the, the propaganda narrative and the, this traditional narrative that's coming out of the Chinese state apparatus. The other thing, of course, that's happening in uh, Taiwan and Japan and, and South Korea is precisely because of the inability to address some of these other issues, um, you're having pressures for labor, you're having pressures for um, 
for who's going to take care of the elderly. And in all of these societies, it's gradually leading to an influx of uh, foreign labor. Uh, so people coming to China, to coming to Japan, South Korea, and Taiwan, generally from Southeast Asia, on short-term contracts to provide domestic services to elderly, to fill low-wage construction jobs. And I can see that potentially as something that might begin pressures that China itself might face, even if it seems very hard to imagine right now. Mm -hmm. and of course, the problem is that also fall, flies directly in the face of many of the nativist policies, ethnocentric policies that you're seeing in China uh, today as well. So those are sort of some of the thoughts about what's happening in Taiwan and Korea and Japan and sort of the relevance for, for China. I'll flag one other thing as well, which is, in all of those other societies, one of the things that's happened is that basically the government's like, we can't really move the needle that much on, on personal fertility decisions. And you just kind of accept that people are gonna have fewer children. Short children. What worries me in China is that I, I do also see this possibility that maybe at some point it might start to look towards other models. There are a range of other countries that faced with perceived demographic problems start to do the heroic mother awards uh, or generally promoting really strongly traditional gender norms or restricting abortion. Different elements of those policies were adopted at different points by Imperial Japan, Soviet Union, Nazi Germany, as they face their own demographic difficulties and begin to try to figure out how do we raise birth rates in a very instrumental manner. And so I'd like to hold out some hope that party leaders might decide to kind of revive or some of their earlier, albeit nominal, commitment to socialist feminism in the process of addressing their own looming demographic challenges, I really worry that it could go in exactly the opposite direction. And of course, that would have dramatic implications for Chinese women, precisely as Dr. Liu has mentioned. We're running close to the end, but I have a few more questions I want to squeeze in. Um, Dr. Liu, do you think China's demographic crisis is something that's keeping Xi Jinping awake at night. I say this because I think a lot of Americans, um, they have a limited view of China oftentimes if they, they only see Beijing and Shanghai and the amazing infrastructure projects that are being built and China's doing this, this, and this, this notion that China's 10 feet tall. Well, clearly this demographic situation is a major point of concern for the Chinese government. Um, does this, should this, does this demographic situation challenge our perception of China? Will it continue to do so further down the road, do you think? I think the current demographic crisis definitely worries top party leadership. Um, if they haven't articulated clearly their concerns, the range of new policies certainly demonstrate how worried they have become after the publication of the recent census data. So the, the key to China, China's dream and you know, China's regime is about China's economic development and its global ambitions. And demographic crisis holds China's economy back and holds its global ambition back. So it's definitely a real concern uh, for top uh, leadership. Agreed. Um, and Carl, you have the honor or the pressure of the last question. Um, since this is, since we are doing an interview for the National Committee on US-China Relations, I'm wondering if China's demographic crisis has any implications on the US-China relationship or if it doesn't now, do you think it could potentially further down the road? I mean, I think, I mean, I focus primarily on domestic policy. So I really think that domestic politics in China, I agree with Dr. Liu that this is sort of one of the biggest, this is the biggest internal challenge, well, maybe one of two, one of the two biggest uh, internal challenges or internal problems China is gonna face over the 21st century. Um, and I think the key thing is that, is that it, this is really, the mood right now, well, both among Chinese party elites, but also in the United States, is that China is somehow on an unstoppable course to sort of emerge as the, you know, uh, undisputed global power of the 21st century. And I just don't think that's true. I mean, I think this is 
the, the people vastly overlook the level of domestic challenges that China is going to confront. Uh, and you just have to look at some of the other developed East Asian countries to realize exactly how severe the challenge is once your society rapidly ages. China is not going to be anywhere near as wealthy as Taiwan, as South Korea, or as Japan as it goes through this process. And really quickly, it's going to face some serious internal challenges that are going to be very internally tense within China itself, and are also going to increasingly require a large number of resources of China, China's, you know, China's own economic resources to address these in any effective manner. So I think that the sort of the major impact of this is perhaps as people begin to appreciate both on in China and on the United States and how serious a challenge this is, it's going to begin to change the impression that sort of China is like this on this unstoppable rise to, you know, it's resolved all the internal problems it possibly can and it's on this unstoppable rise to 21st century dominance. I think that's going to be the major impact of uh, the demographic because it's a serious challenge for China in terms of everything, uh, economically, socially, across the board within China itself. Well, although that's ending on a slightly pessimistic, although realistic note, I want to thank both Carl and Dr. Leo so much for sharing their thoughts and taking the time to speak with us today. I hope those of you who have turned in, tuned in and found um, this interview um, we hope you found it interesting and informative and that you'll be interesting in watching more of our digital content and that you will join us for future national Coded committee programming. Thanks again, everyone. Thank you to our speakers. Take care and have a nice day. Thanks so much. Thank you.